Welcome to another episode of Made with Intention. My co-host Candice Tavina was off, so today you're rocking with me, Megan Tamila Burke, and our guest du jour, Emily Lerner. Emily and I connected last year when she reached out for coaching after seeing me down shots at Candice's birthday party. And since then, she's helped me identify my dream client because it is her. Thank you so much for being here. You didn't know that? <laughs> the I shock didn't on your know face. That. <laughs> you are my ideal client avatar. So thank wow. you so much for being here. Who are you? Where are you? What are you about? Um, I'm <clears throat> I am on the floor with that compliment. So thank you so much. Honored. Um uh I'm Emily Lerner. I'm the founder of Skillstruck Studio. I'm a leadership coach. Um, I'm based in Silicon Valley. Um, and uh before I was a leadership coach, before I founded Skillstruck Studio. I spent about 20 years, a little over 20 years um, in corporate HR, mostly in the tech world, also a little bit in media in New York as well. Love it. So with that, if it's not clear, we're here today to talk about professional relationships, more specifically navigating professional relationships and leveraging, to the, leveraging them to your benefit. So to dive right in, Emily, as a leadership coach and someone who is often on the outside now, looking in, thank God, right? <laughs> <laughs> what are your observations about communication or miscommunication in the workplace? Yeah, I think um, I'm super excited to be here talking about this. I think partly because when we're navigating professional relationships, and I think people who are listening who care about navigating their professional relationships, um, they're probably doing caring about that or wanting to do it because there's some sort of issue. There's some sort of um, something that they want to navigate that's not, you know, sunshine and roses. Um, and that means there's probably a struggle and there's a desire to better communicate or to um, improve that relationship in some way. Um, and for me, I think most communication comes from or most communication can be improved by um, improving the feedback that goes both ways in a professional relationship. So that's giving feedback and also receiving feedback. So what's going on there feedback-wise in your professional relationship or in the relationship that you are thinking about and figuring out how to navigate? Not on the list of things that we said to discuss, but I'm just curious, have you, have you noticed that there are hmm, recurring issues, you know, are, are, um, hmm, common faults to say that need to be addressed, especially as re in regards to women, because I have a list. <laughs> well, yeah, I have a list too. Um, are there common things in regards to women? Yeah. I mean, there are, right. Um, and some of them are really hard, right? I think as women, we get a lot of feedback that is either ranges from, look, we get a lot of really helpful feedback. We also get a lot of well-meaning feedback that is frankly also helpful, but, uh, also really sexist. Yeah, so, for sure. <laughs> some of that, I don't. You know, uh, I think we, in some ways, we all have to figure out how we're going to deal with that and receive that in our own way. Because a, a lot of folks will be like, hey, like, you should smile more or whatever, which is gross. Um, but sometimes isn't wrong either. True. Um, and I got, I'll tell you, I once got this really difficult piece of feedback when I was learning to be a public speaker, which is something that was really hard for me. And um, one of the really senior people at my company was like, you know what? Like you, what you really need to do is be more vulnerable up there. Mm. And that, that was not the answer. <laughs> In that case. I was trying to build credibility as a public speaker with my company who had seen me really not have credibility as a public speaker. And I said – to this guy, like flat out, I was like, I think that's really sexist feedback and I'm not going to take it. Uh, we had a really high trust relationship. So I was able to say that and he thought about it and came back to me and he was like, yeah, that was the wrong feedback. Like I'm okay. glad you said that to me. Okay. 
I don't really recommend that approach. Um, but I share that as an example of as women, we get really jacked feedback sometimes. Yeah, especially depending on who the source is, right? Yeah, because I think most feedback we get, right, is um, feedback from upward relationships that where the power dynamic is that we have less power. Yeah. Generally, that's the feedback we get. Um, and it's hard for us, for anyone, well, maybe I think more so for women. I don't, I can't speak to men, right? Um, it can be harder to deliver upward feedback too. When we're saying, hey, you communicate with me in X way, it would be more helpful for you to communicate with me in Y way. That could be really hard feedback to deliver to our boss, to the CEO of our company. Um, and it hits different when it's from a woman to mm -hmm. a man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel that. I spent, you know, I'm grateful now looking back. I, I never had many... Uh, like female superiors, I for the most shocker. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was mostly men. But this may be an unpopular opinion. I'm actually pretty grateful for that because one, I worked under, especially once I left, you know, corporate vibes or whatever you want to call it. Once I started doing more non traditional work, I'm very grateful that I worked under a lot of white men all around the world because it taught me. Um, you mentioned radical candor. It taught me. <sighs> radical confidence and <laughs> I learned just get the shit fucking done you know just get yeah. it done that's yeah. the payments and own and also to own own your work and I feel like um that can just come sometimes like from a negative perspective as to you know people think of oh I made a mistake and own it no 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 like also own the greatness because a, a lot of them own mediocre mediocrity right like they're gonna yes. do what they what they did so then yes. for us it can common feedback right it's boastful um I know that I've turned people off very much with my confidence which I'm very grateful for because perfect it's like a it's like a shield <laughs> yes I, I think there – you just hit on like four things in there, maybe three things in there that I think are super worth like diving into. And, you know, one of them is excellence really speaks for itself. Um, yeah. And when you tie it into or when you look at it in your relationships across your work, right, whether you work in a big company, small company, whether you work for yourself, whatever it is – when your work is excellent, when your work is the best, um, you you can worry a little bit less That's about your relationships. Point. That's a great point. And my work's always been excellent. I never thought about that. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you look at, and this, this, this is a terrible example, please don't be like these people. But if you look at, you know, typically, you know, we call it in the tech world, like, the rock star assholes, right? Um, who are people who turn into like the Elon Musks or whomever. Don't be like them. But their work speaks for themselves. They can walk around being a jerk. Everyone who works in an office knows this person. Yep. Their work is so excellent that they set fire to the people all around them and their, those relationships and it doesn't matter. Yeah. So if you're that good, like, congratulations. That's amazing. You can worry mm -hmm. a lot less about this stuff. That's so true. Um, and, and that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. There was something else in there that you said that was like, oh, when, when you were talking about being, you know, quote unquote, boastful and how that some people don't receive that well or whatever. Um, one of the things that I think is really key to navigating your relationships at work is authenticity. Um, because it, it, what's the point in navigating them in a way that is not authentic? Because what does it mean to navigate them? Does it, you know, you want to navigate them in a way that brings great results to you. What are great results to you? Well, a great result to you, 
I sincerely hope means leaving you feeling good at the end of the day. And if you don't feel good at the end of the day, if you're not authentic, you don't. And that would just be really sad. With that in mind, let's say there's someone who, a woman in particular, who struggles with initiating quote unquote conflict, you know, or, or tough, tough conversations. Right. And she is in a position where she needs, or hopefully will give upward feedback. Yeah. What then do you suggest? How, how does she go about that in a way that is authentic to her then if she thinks now I would argue that, um, that, that trait of being, of not wanting to initiate, uh, quote unquote, tough conversations is not necessarily a characteristic (laughs) of a person that's personally me, but let's say it is, (laughs) how would she navigate that in an authentic fashion? Yeah. Um, I think I do want to pause there for a second and say, I have seen so many leaders in my experience who are afraid of conflict. It's Mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. It is so, I actually, I frankly see it more in men. I do in women. Yeah, for and sure. It, I, it is so tied to this perception of wanting, like, or this desire, this deep desire to be perceived as a good guy, mm. to be liked by everyone. Um, it is, and it is, um, it is a disease. Like, it will kill you at work. Um, nothing makes you disliked more than trying to be liked by everyone. Tough in life. Yeah. Um, it's not, it's not good. Please don't do it. Um, but, but your actual question was if there, as a woman, if you are, um, trying to deliver upward feedback, um, but you are afraid of conflict, how do you do that? Um, I mean, part of the answer is like, you have to buck up, right? Yeah. Um, but how you buck up, um, So I love the framework of radical candor. It's a book. It's a book by Kim Scott. Highly, highly, highly recommend if you are trying to navigate a professional relationship of any kind. Um, And basically what radical candor is, is a way of, and this is like extremely um, oversimplifying again, like read the book. It's great. Um, Is delivering feedback in a way that both challenges directly and cares powerfully. And so you're not just saying to someone, you know, your communication style sucks. You're saying to someone, your communication style sucks. Um, And I'm telling you this because I really care about the impact that that is having to you as a leader. Mm. Um. And, and it is this radical candor style feedback that for me, like really flipped a switch in me that made me actually believe the old saying that feedback is a gift. Um, I never really believed it until I internalized radical candor and, and understood that like the <laughs> intense feedback I was getting was actually being given to me because the people I was hearing it from really cared about me and wanted to see me succeed. And that's the spirit in which giving feedback becomes, I think, easier. Definitely. Even in my personal relationships, for sure, it's, there are certain people, it's just so easy for us to get feedback. And as I've gotten older, I realize, like, oh, maybe it's because we both really care about each other. Um, yeah. Or even with that confidence, right? It's like, oh, I feel confident in how you feel about me and how you want the best for me. So it's easier to receive feedback. I used to think I was, I, I didn't used to take feedback well, especially like in my 20s. And as I've gotten older, I realized, no, I just didn't <laughs> take feedback from you because also yes. you didn't know how to deliver it. And you yes. probably kind of low key didn't want the best for me. Well, I, you know, and, and going back to this, you know, old saying feedback is a gift, right? We don't love every gift we're given and we don't, mm-hmm. we, we return some of them or re-gift some of them. True. Um, and so we can look critically at some of the feedback we get too and say like, no, I reject your feedback that I should smile more. And we can say to some feedback, oh, you know what? I, um, I accept that. 
you know, I do need to get better at public speaking. That's, that's, that's the area in which like, that's where I became like, Oh God, this is a gift. You are really, you do want me to get good at this. Um, and that I think it makes all the difference. Um, and I think it's also how, you know, when you are giving feedback, um, and when you're receiving it, that it's actually feedback and not complaining. Mm, true. Um, Thin line. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if you're complaining, if you're complaining, um, you don't, you don't care that much <laughs> about, um, what you're complaining about and there's no, um, action that the person can take yeah. to make the situation better. That's just complaining. There's no real need to do that. Yeah. I mean, do it at home or to your Which is like home. everywhere in the workplace, right? Um, that's always one of my pet peeves is people who come with problems instead of solutions. Mm -hmm. and it's like, wow, so you just, you spent all this time and this breath, but you still don't have anything to offer in regards to how yeah. this could be better. Oh, I'm getting tingly. Like not even, <laughs> I got the opposite of tingles. I got like stress yeah. in my chest. Shivers? Just thinking about it. Shivers because I just got very triggered thinking about the American workplace. Um <sighs> And that trend of, this is like kind of unrelated, the trend of no, complaining. It's so related. Oh my, it is. I didn't even notice until I started working abroad um, that it's, it's, I don't get it. I don't, why, 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 why is that a trend? It's a really good question. Um, so I think it's really related um, because I think it, it has to do with part of why our work relationships can be so dysfunctional um, because we're complaining rather than giving feedback or people sure. are complaining to us rather than giving us feedback. They're complaining about our work rather than giving us feedback about our work. I didn't or talking like shit to Sarah instead yeah. about how home, you know, you didn't like this yeah. from Bill instead of just going to tell Bill what exactly. the fuck is up. Or like, I didn't like, this work product of yours. Well, that's not feedback. Yep. What can I do about that? Oh, you didn't like it. Okay. Sorry. I don't, I don't like your tie or whatever. Like, right. What are you going to do about it? It's so frustrating. I also think a, a big piece of, I don't know. It's like, imagine a world where people, everyone just liked their jobs. I had um, a consultation, I think a week or two ago, and it was to, help her manage her workload, which is why companies hire me to bring me in um, yeah. to help their, you know, their overachieving employees, my people, how to uh, be more realistic and, and manage their workload because they're usually wildly overwhelmed as I feel most people are, or a lot of people are rather. But I pointed out to her that it took her approximately 33 minutes of the call to mention some that she, there's a piece of her job that she really loves. And there's like a certain mm -hmm. team that she works with that she loves. And I stopped her like, so why did you take 33 minutes to, to say that? And so our homework when we hopped off was to create a gratitude journal because it was <sighs> taking you 33 minutes to, to mention the great. And I just, there's an overwhelming trend um, of that. I even, I went to, I spoke at No Madness Fest in September of last year. And it was the first time since I had moved back to the States in that year and a half that I encountered people, especially women who like their jobs. I was asking them about their jobs. Like, oh my God, I love my job so much. I said, oh, that's, I said, people, pe there are people who like their jobs. It's crazy. I didn't know. But also if you hate your job so much, why don't you get a new one? Because it's more fun to complain. It's, I don't know that it's more fun to complain. Is it not? Is it a cycle? Is that what it is? Look, I also think like we have, <laughs> you really want me to get started. Um, it all comes down to capitalism. Yeah, for sure. I don't know that we have time to cover that, that part. today. Um, but I do like, look, I think, I do think the American workplace is completely disintegrating mm -hmm. and people feel totally powerless and they're not entirely wrong about that. Um, and so complaining is really natural. I don't, I don't totally want to shame people for complaining, but I do want to redirect them. Oh, that's so kind of you. I'm here to shame you. <laughs> I, well, I think it makes us a good team. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> because, you know, I think you need a little, it's some tough love and some, some soft love, right? Um, 
because I think you can be redirected from complaining because there are things you can change that you can change, you know, in yourself and how you deal with the things that you're complaining about. Yeah. That part complain and then put action behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of cycles, you had mentioned, and this is something that I've noticed with my clients who my corporate clients are all women and I love working with them love so, that. so, so much. Um, you mentioned that, you know, let's say there's an issue with my boss. It's usually a cycle and it's, yeah. you know, this project and then this feedback and then this, and then this is, these are my thoughts about the feedback. And then this project is yeah. something I notice often, but more importantly, something that I have to navigate with them is how to change the narrative. Firstly, this could be very, no, I was going to say, I know I was going to discount it. So I take that back. Um, for me anyway, the first thing I always suggest is mindset because so many of the clients I encounter are like, well, my boss always does this. My boss always does that. Well, if you just put out there that your boss always does this and your boss always does that, then you're projecting that and your boss is going to then always do this and always do that. Yeah. And then secondly, right, is the action to change the narrative itself physically with action. So yeah, what do you suggest? How how do you suggest we change the narrative? What are the steps to take? Yeah, so I think... I do really think changing the narrative is so important because I I think it's so hard in those relationships that we find so difficult. It's that frustration. It's that com- complaining. It's that like, it, it, you know, I hate my boss. He always does this, right? Exactly what you're talking about. It it, ugh, it just it <laughs> it brings me back, right? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so. Um, there's this relationship ex- expert, Esther Peril. Um, and she's in this example, like she's talking about like romantic relationships, but I think this is so, so relevant to work relationships. When we're in a pattern like that, she says, it's like a dance. We both know the steps. So if I'm in this pattern with my boss where I say, okay, I think we should do this project. And he comes back with like 8 million tiny, or, or he, he, is like, yes, I think we should. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. And then he comes back and is like, actually, I changed my mind. And we go through this every time, right? Like that's a terrible pattern. I'm losing my mind. He's probably losing his mind. But it's a dance. It's a dance we do. We both know the steps of the dance. And we're wearing a pattern in the, in the floor. Um, and the only way to change it or the only way that I, the only power that I have to change it is to change the steps that I'm taking, um, to change the steps of my dance. And that, you know, can go a couple different ways, right? Either it knocks him off balance and he falls on the floor, which hopefully it doesn't, or (laughs) he follows the lead of my new steps. And look, I I think that goes both ways. Mm Mm-hmm. Because if I approach the problem, the same well-worn problem that we're having, the same rut we're in, if I approach it in a different way, it's at least going to be different. Right. We might have a different problem. (laughs) But it'll be different. At least it's going to be different. Um, And that difference is going to shed some light on this tricky relationship. Valid. I like that. Um, I also like what you said about changing the the steps in the dance, right? And changing how you move in the dance, which speaks yeah. very well to influence, which we'll get into after this quick little break. As a thank you for listening, I'd love to offer my program, The Pivot, at a 15% discount. If you are feeling stuck in your career, The Pivot is designed for you. It's three 45-minute sessions, one session per week for three weeks, um, plus one additional 20-minute accountability session four weeks later. The Pivot is usually $997, but for Made With Intention listeners, it's $847 through the end of March. You can check it out at skillstruckstudio.com slash pivot. If you have any questions, please hit me up. You can find me at hi at skillstruckstudio.com. I'm so excited to hear your thoughts on 
successfully and tactfully <laughs> leveraging <laughs> relationships because I'm a firm believer. Some may say, what did you say? You said, um, oh, influence versus manipulation. Yeah. I'm very proudly, not proudly, we won't, I'm manipulative <laughs> and we're just going to call it what it is. I, I own it. I always have it ever since I was a kid. <laughs> it is what it is. If I need to get something out of someone, I'm probably going to make it happen. But it's also what makes me great at customer service and sales and all these different things, right? And so, yeah, I would love to hear your okay. thoughts on the art of the influence. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you something or share uh, my definition of manipulation with you okay. and ask you if you agree. identify. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm excited. Um, I would say that influence is about, um, I was going to say influencing someone. Haha, ha, that's not a helpful definition. Um, influence is about working with someone to um, accomplish something that's a shared goal. And I would say that manipulation is getting someone to do something they don't want to do. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah, then I often get people um, to do something they thought they didn't want to do. Okay. Los dos, you know, to well, am, am I more influential than manipulative? Claro que sí. Are there times yes. where I am manipulative because I want something out of the situation and they don't? Yeah. Yeah. But I'm, right. I'm I think that's fair. Comfortable. I obviously would never do it in a way that would like, you know, physically harm someone or cause no. them great distress. Of course. No. You know what I mean? But maybe, um, you know, <laughs> one of my guy friends is here. He doesn't, it doesn't benefit him to go downstairs and get my food from the delivery guy. Will he do it? Yeah. Okay. That's very funny. Is he also getting his food? Nope. Just mine. I, just actually, I encountered this man the other day, um, not even like a month ago this older American guy. And I was telling him how I learned as a, you know, as a woman that just, even as just as a human to just fall back, but especially as a woman, I always wanted to do everything. So when I was a backpacker, I would pick up my backpack. The man will go for it, the driver. And I say, no, I got it. I got the backpack because, because I just had to be so strong. Yeah. You're now so independent. I, I'm so independent. I can do it all. I don't care now. Oh my, I'm useless. I'm a puppy in the streets. I'm useless. <laughs> um, and I was telling him how I often, how like in Medellin, for example, these men are so chivalrous. They're so, they just appear. When I have bags, they appear. I never That's carry nice. suitcases. They're, they are the best. And I mentioned to him how usually when I ask a man to do something, if any, if anyone here wants to use this line, I always just say, oh, but I touch a soft touch on the bicep and then just say, oh, but it just looks so much better when you do it. And it works. They eat it up because the ego, right? I get it. I would that's too. That's not manipulation. That's influence. But they have, well, they have no desire to do it until they do, because then they feel so great about themselves, right? They got to show up for me in this way. And he said, well, I wouldn't do that. He's like, unless like, basically he said, unless we were fucking, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that for you. <laughs> do you know, 10 minutes later, he did something for me. I touched his arm and I said, it looks so much better when you, when you do it. And he just stared at me like, you got me. And I said, I know. Why'd you doubt it? Why'd okay. Let me it? argue why that's influence. Not okay. Yeah, please. So there, you know, the art of influence is, is generally considered to be four, four pieces. Um, credibility, common ground, evidence, and emotional connection. And instead of me going through those in like a super boring way, let's use your example. Um, so credibility. So how do you establish, uh, like in a professional environment, you would be, and you're trying to influence someone to add headcount to their team, right? You would, you would have, um, you would be like, well, I am the person who um, makes hiring decisions and does workforce planning for this team, right? So that's, that would maybe be your credibility. How do you have credibility in this situation on the street when you are asking someone to help you? How would I have credibility yeah. as someone in the street? So like if there was Someone yeah. coming by and I said, hey, could you help me with my bag? Yeah. In this situation, how do you have credibility? My credibility. 
Um, I guess just the fact that the bag is there and I need help with it. Like, is yep. that evidence enough? Yeah, I think that's great. Okay. Sure. Um, so I think that's very tied to evidence. So like, what's the data that you're presenting to this man um, that you're going to use to influence him? That to... I have this heavy bag and I'm here and I'm a helpless puppy. Yes. So I think your credibility might be, um, your, um, hmm. I think these two are kind of related in this example. Um, you know, your credibility might actually be that you're asking. True. Like the ask itself. And then the evidence would be like, look at my heavy bags. Right. And I usually just show my hands. I'm like, my hands are not meant for this. Mm -hmm. Like, (laughs) I, I look at my beautiful nails, right? Yeah. Um, now the emotional connection. So typically when you are trying to influence someone, um, it's useful, useful to forge some kind of emotional connection. I'm not saying you have to like be in love with your boss to convince them to add headcount to your team. Um, but some kind of, um, like it's easier to influence someone you know, versus someone you don't know. Now, in your case, you're trying to influence someone you don't know. Um, what is the emotional connection in that example? With someone I don't know, the emotional connection, honestly, is that it's a man and like, you know. Is it the flattery you're giving? Is oh, it the like for them. On the arm? I would say it's the flattery. It's the um the flattery and then the the ego boost is the like the end result. So the last piece of it, and and I think, you know, because again, this is actually about navigating professional relationships. Um, this is the most important piece to professional relationships. And we'll get we'll get back there in a second, um, after I convince you that you are influencing and not manipulating. Um is common ground. So like when you're influencing someone, um, it's generally really important to find common ground because what you're what you're saying to them is you should do what I want to do because it's also what you want to do. For sure. And so in this case, you're saying, I want you to carry my bags, but you should do it because also you want to carry my bags. Definitely. And I do believe that they want it, which I think, again, mindset, I do genuinely believe that a big reason why it happens is because I do wholeheartedly believe that they want to show up for me. Right. So- you're not manipulating them. You're not getting them to do something they don't want to do. You're creating right. the opportunity. For them to want to do it and then to do it. Yeah. I like it. I like how you manipulated that. Into influence. <laughs> no, no, no. That was, that was all influence. Come on. <laughs> that was definitely all influence. <laughs> that, that Done. I'm an influence. influencer. That was just, you are, you are, you, you are amazing at influence. Um, So that frame, that notion of like finding a common ground, finding the place where your goal meets the influencee's goal, the person you're trying to influence. Like, I think oftentimes when we're trying to influence someone, particularly at work, we assume that they know. We assume Mm -hmm. that they know that we are, are trying to accomplish the same thing as them. Very true. But like they, they don't, people are not, I'm going to say people are not smart. That's not true. Um, Conscious, they, aware. Yeah. They're not like awake sometimes. They're not like, it's hard. We're busy. A lot of stuff happens in a day. And so we don't take a second to think about, we're just like, why are you telling this is annoying? Like, ah. Yeah. It's also tough when, you know, the manager or whoever hasn't, because that's something I also get common feedback is they haven't created a common goal as well. And that's another huge piece of this, right? Is whoever is steering the ship yes. hasn't even created the a, a common uh, dire- a, a direction for everyone to go in. And so sometimes I think also it can feel like overstepping or like you said, being over communicative or I don't care about these details, but really they, they assume we, from both sides, we're assuming yes. that there's a common ground, right? That is so great. And I'm so glad you mentioned this. Um, so I led a team um, in my last role. I led a team, a reasonably sized team. And something I absolutely loved 
um, was when the people I managed who were amazing, I, I had an incredible team. They were all like better than I was, to be honest with you. Um, and that's the kind of team I love. Um, I loved when they, uh, oh, what was the word you said? I can't remember it now, but, but basically when they were like, oh, when they overstepped, I loved when they overstepped. I was like, please overstep. Like, tell me, tell me what's better. Tell me like, so don't assume, I would say start with, don't assume that your manager doesn't want that. Yep. (laughs) That's so true. Actually, that's a great point. I actually do uh, enjoy overstepping. Yeah. Like, so to put it a super bluntly, sometimes when you overstep, it's less work for your manager. And you're like, I think we should be um, working towards this goal in these three ways. Like that is a lot less work for your manager. So like hook them up. Yeah. And you might have better ideas than them anyway. So, so true. And they can't be great at everything. No. Um, and maybe you're not getting – a lot of people do not get direction from upwards um, because the folks – above above i hate talking about it that way but it's useful they 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 forget this too they're like no everyone knows what we're working towards but i'm not going to remind them so no one is taking the time to create that common ground yeah. um and when we talk about you know the concept of managing up this is part of it. We talk about managing up like it's a bad thing. It, it's not necessarily a bad I thing. I think it's a great thing and also a um, a wonderful skill set to foster. And if you are struggling with that, let me tell you, I could write a book. Hit me up, especially if it's a man and you're a woman. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it, part of managing up is saying, okay, like, we know what I'm going to work on this quarter. I am working on it with this goal in mind. Mm -hmm. Is that the right goal to be working towards? And your manager's like, no, it's this goal instead. Great. You're going to create better work towards that goal. Yep. And then, you know, as you're doing it, you're like, oh, well, it's leading me towards this goal. You talk to your manager. Like it just, um, you get into a way more productive place and and a relationship that is much more, um, give and take, yeah, than a relationship that is just um handing things down and then handing things back, absolutely. And I mean, I think it goes without saying, but even just from that example, you hear how, from the manager's perspective, this person is more valuable to them, no? Yes, it is what it is. And I, yeah, you know, I so often again, all of my 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 clients who are in, again, employers will bring me in to help them manage their workload. And of course, that's not all it's about because it's me. Um, A big piece of it is I hear things like, you know, we were talking about this the other day, actually, on the um, the Maven Roundtable about how, oh, this man, he he just got this promotion because it's a man. Mm -hmm. Now, are there trends? Of course. Is the patriarchy alive and well and driving? Yes, it is. But also, let's with that radical candor, let's take some (laughs) radical responsibility and also acknowledge how that man probably showed up differently. And I think that often we bring it back down to confidence, right? But I don't think it's always that because, like you said, that guy is probably more comfortable. He probably doesn't even think twice. About no. giving that that upward feedback, no. or like, oh, how, why don't we do it like this? Or oh, I I thought that we would just do it like that. It's those type of things that get you noticed, but also it's those type of that that that's um, useful to to the to the other person. And like you said, it's often for the managers. It can just be you're going down, you're you're giving to them, you're giving to them. What do you get out of it? It's interesting. I will say, in terms of receiving feedback. I will say, and I, you know, I'm, I was going to say I'm reluctant to generalize, but it is a generalization that really bore out for me in my time as a manager. Women were really great at receiving and incorporating feedback and men a lot less so. I agree. Um, And one of the ways that I saw play out a lot is as a manager, I told my team like, hey, come to me with a problem. Come to me when things get really messed up. Like I want to know 
Like, don't hide your mistakes. Come to me and we will, we will get them. Um, but when you come to me, come to me with a solution too. Um, it can be dumb. It can be whatever, but just like bring the solution as well. Um, and the women on my team were so great at it. Like, so good. They would be like, okay, here's the problem. Here's my solution. And like when they first started doing it, the solutions like maybe weren't the best, but they became really good with practice. It was not something that in general, generally speaking, the men on my teams have been that good at adjusting to. It was much more. And I do wonder if that's partly because I was a woman as well. They were like, here's my problem. Yeah. I also think with feedback with men, a lot of the time, at least for me, they need proof. Whereas with women, you can give a piece of feedback and I think they can be introspective enough to sit with it and think, oh, I could see how, you know, this time, or I could see how that, whereas with men, at least for me, often in a workplace, it's you give the feedback and then a few weeks later, you have to follow up and see it, say like, did you see there how that played a part? And that Oh, and then a few weeks later, do you see how that? Oh, okay. And then they become a bit more receptive, at least in my experience. So I will say that's that's a great um, that's a great thing to bring up because for folks who are nervous about delivering feedback um, and and don't quite know how to do it. Um, there's a great model for delivering feedback. It's called the SBI model and it's situation behavior impact. Mm. And it's really like, it makes it super straightforward to do. And so, um, what you do is you describe the situation. So, um, you might say, um, in yesterday's team meeting, so the situation was in the team meeting yesterday, the behavior, um, you interrupted Lucy and the impact was um, we didn't get to hear her ideas and you looked like a jerk. Um, And so there you go. Like one, two, three, there's your feedback. Um, And, you know, you're going to want to like dress that up like a tiny bit. Of course. (laughs) Um, course. Because it would be weird. (laughs) Like if you sat down with someone and you were like, hey, in yesterday's um, team meeting with Lucy, you interrupted her and we didn't get to hear her ideas and you looked like a jerk. But you could actually leave it at that if you really can't muster up anything else to say around that. And depending Um, on who it is, right, they may actually just receive it just fine that way. Yeah. And it's super clear. There's an example. And if more things like that happen again, you just repeat that model. Mm -hmm. Um, And it leaves you prepared with an example, not just like you're a jerk who interrupts people in meetings. Right. So true. It's also, I like that model because it's to the points. And I think, from my experience, from what I've witnessed, and again, working with women and coaching women, is things can just get long-winded. And tact and efficient communication is is something that I think helps you. Not I think, I know, at least for me, it's helped me stand out. But I would caution anyone who maybe is hesitant or nervous about giving feedback to get to the motherfucking point. And yes. It, I think it does more harm than good when you are adding in all the fluff and the, even, even, you know, the whole sandwich. Yeah. No, I hate the sandwich. Everyone I hate hates the sandwich, the sandwich too. Sandwich. And you don't, if you pause and think about the feedback that you've received, when you get that sandwich feedback, when you get the like little tap dance around it and the like 8 million words to say five words it leaves you really confused. It leaves you trying to figure out what was said, trying to understand what the takeaway is. Like when you turn around and apply it to yourself, for me anyway, I'm just like, oh, that's not helpful. I never understand what someone is trying to say to me unless Mm -hmm. they say it really clearly. To yeah, be, does not feel good to leave a meeting confused about how someone just critiqued you. Like, okay, I know they just critiqued me on something, but I actually don't even really know what it was. 
No. And the thing with the sandwich is when you get the sandwich, like, oh, hey, you had a really great idea in that meeting yesterday. Um, but, but in the team meeting, you interrupted Lucy and we didn't hear her idea and you looked like a jerk. Um, I also, I, I also really appreciated, um, the presentation you gave later. So if I get that feedback, I don't, I don't believe the two things on either side. Very true. I don't believe it. I also, for me, it also kind of feels like, um, at least I'm great at so many things, right? So it's just like, out of all the things, those are the two of the sandwich that you, and and we don't even, we, we don't even have enough time to say all the things that I'm great at. You know, we don't have enough time in this meeting. So let's just focus on whatever the fuck you got to say so we can all keep it moving. It's, it's like, who, who's going to believe it? Who's going to be like, yeah, thank you so much for those two pieces of great feedback when you're Mm -hmm. slamming me for interrupting Lucy. Right. And coming off like a jerk. Yeah. Like like great presentation though. Yeah. Like, thanks. Why couldn't you just tell me I had a great presentation all by itself? Yeah, no. It feels crappy. You know, it's something else I've learned, again, from men is even, um, I remember I was with one of my guy friends, shout out to Chad, and I was following up with someone in, in a sales way. I had sent a, a pitch and I was like, man, what do I say? He said, any other thoughts about this? And just send it. And I yeah. think that can translate to so many things. We we <sighs> We overthink so many things. Say um, what you mean, right? Say what you mean and mean what you say. Yeah. On that note of saying what you mean and meaning what you say and also just speaking up, any other lasting tips to leave us with in regards to communication, leveraging our relationships, leading our influential lives <laughs> and not manipulative <laughs> ones or any other tips for the <laughs> introverts? Uh, oh, my introverts, my people. Um, Maybe going through it. Okay. I'm going to... I'm going to try to cram in as much as I can as we're wrapping up. Um, For my introverts, I am a hardcore introvert. Um, Look, some things are harder for us. Um, It's not that we can't do it. um, But let's remember, like, it's about where your energy, where you get your energy. So no, you're not going to get your energy from like diving in and tackling these relationships, right? Uh, but you can do it. It's just building up a skill set like anyone else. Extroverts have to build up the skill set too. Um, so in a sense, you know, introverts and extroverts are in the same boat. Might be a little harder for introverts, but some things are harder for extroverts too. Definitely. So, you know, shout out. Like to for, for a lot of them, don't, they don't know um, when to shut the fuck up. No, no. Um, and that's, you know, we all, we all have our stuff to work on. Yep. Um, in terms of like communication, navigating these relationships, all of this, um, I just, for me, it always comes back to authenticity, like be authentic, be yourself. That is, is going to guide you. It's never going to guide you wrong. Um, I also think if you are struggling in a relationship at work, I guess in your personal life too, if you can approach that struggle from a place of curiosity rather than a place of frustration, fear, or anger, um, that curiosity will get you a lot farther. You You don't have to come from a place of like loving this person or wanting to be best friends with this person. But if you can come from curiosity of wondering, where's this relationship going off course? What can I do? What might be going on with them? That will help you a ton. I like that a lot. I always um, encourage people to think of everything as practice and like it's just practice for the next time so that hopefully for future you, it's even easier. Future you. Always. That's my lady. I love her. 
even pe- but past me, present me, future me, all, all the me's. <laughs> I just love her. Um, thank you so, 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 so much, Emily. I really enjoyed this. And I especially enjoyed finding out that I'm influential and not manipulative. <laughs> thank you so much to all of you for joining us. I've included a bunch of helpful resources for you in the show notes, as well as a link to connect with Emily so you can show up as the boss you were meant to be. Also, I'm going to include a link to Emily's newsletter. Don't tell other people, but it is my favorite newsletter. It's called <gasps> Stuff By. It's every two weeks. It is to the point. It's so good, Emily. I, you know, I say it all the Thank time, you. but it really, it's the only newsletter that I religiously read. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, Candace and I would so appreciate a review. And until next time, stay kind.